Well, we're in the middle of our series, Unto Us, which is our series that we're discussing Christmas as we kind of get into this season. And it's something that I really, uh, for me, is something that feels a little bit extra special because when I think about the Lord and I think about Christmas, I always like to think ahead to what the Lord came to do, right? And so this year we were kind of focusing on those two words, unto us. Because we understand that it's not just important that Jesus was born. It's not even just important that God came to dwell amongst us. It's actually the, the importance is on what He came to do, how He did it, and what that means to me. Because how many of you understand that without the latter part, this part really has no significance? So I want to jump into the passage of Scripture, and we're going to read it every week, uh, sort of as our way of launching into uh, our messages. But I want to jump back into Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And this is what it says. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, of course, we understand that those names and those titles which are given to Jesus were not just something that were required of us. And it's not that Isaiah was prophesying that this would be the correct way of addressing Jesus. Really, these names and these titles are given willingly by people who have an appreciation for what Christ has done in their life, correct? When you understand what God came and did, when you understand how that impacts your life, when you understand what it means that Jesus came to bring salvation and to set you free, when you get to experience that, then the response that we offer back is to attribute to the Lord these wonderful names because it is the only way that we have of expressing our appreciation and our gratitude towards the Lord who came to do what He did. And of course, last week we talked about the idea of hope. That because Jesus came, that we now literally have hope in Christ. But it takes us beyond the, the, the day-to-day -day, uh, gr grind. That's the word I'm trying to come up with. But it takes us beyond that day-to-day -day grind and all the things that come against us in life, and it gives us something that we look forward to in this life and also in the next. And so we have hope in Christ. But Christ didn't come just to bring us hope. He came to bring us things like hope and love and joy and peace. And those are the things that we're going to be talking about over these next uh, few weeks. But what I want to focus in on today is the idea that as Jesus came, one of the things that He came to bring to us that we might get to experience is the love of God. And how many of you understand, like, for me, the love of God is what has transformed my life. Experiencing God's love is not only a precious thing, and it's not just something that uh, to us has some value. It literally is transformative to understand that the God of the universe loves me. And when you experience that love, it can't help but change who you are. It softens hardened hearts. It helps us to refocus in on the goodness of God instead of just the judgment of God. Because when you understand that God loves you, you also understand that God is not against you. And how many of us at some point started out in that place of believing that somehow that God was against us? You know, maybe we wouldn't put it in those terms. But many of us have walked around feeling the judgment and the criticism of God and religion. And God's love changes that. Because God loves, God's love supersedes all of those wrong ideas 
All of those wrong notions, all of those things that we have come to believe about who God is that are false, God's love comes and it breaks through those things. And so today I want to really touch on what God's love is like. Why God's loving us is so important and so transformative. And really just touch a little bit of what that looks like in our lives. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to you right now that you've heard before. It's common. It's so common, you could say it. We've used it in sermons before. But John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say? Just recite whatever version you know in your head right now as I say this. But is this, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but what? Have eternal life. And here's what I really want to focus in on. You see, oftentimes, we start out, we read those verses, and there's so much in that verse, right? I mean, it's, it's a loaded verse. But oftentimes, what we really do is we focus on the last part of that passage of Scripture. Because the last part is the part about eternal life and forgiveness. And that is really, in a nutshell, what we preach about it when we talk about the Gospel, right? And that is really what we look forward to. But I want to point you to the very first words of this passage of Scripture, which says, For God so loved the world. You see, everything that God does in that verse is predicated on the idea that God so loved the world. Come on, y'all. Jump in here with me. You see, here's the thing. Without God's love for us, and let me put this a little bit differently, without God's love for you, the rest of this doesn't even happen. You see, God didn't come to save just because He was obligated to. Does that make sense? God didn't come to do what He did because He had to. Because He had no choice. The choice was His. And honestly, He owes us nothing. But God loved us so much. I love that term. So much. You see, I think we might even have in the back of our minds the idea that, well, God loves us, but maybe He kind of only loves us a little bit. Or maybe His love for us is really not that big. But what this verse is teaching us is God loved us so much. That's huge. God's love for us is big. And we need to recognize that because we need to understand that this is what motivated God to do everything that He has done on our behalf because He loved us so much. And so, He came and He did what He did because He loved us. Let me tell you something. God didn't have to do any of it. And really, honestly, God could have washed His hands. But when it says God so loved the world, it means that He made the choice not to wash His hands. That while we were still a mess, and we'll get into that a little bit today, but while we were still a mess, that God still came because He loved us enough that He could not walk away from us. Isn't it good to know that God loves you that much? That He could not walk away from you. He could not leave you. Now listen, have you ever been in a really tough situation and you had to make a choice? Like it's me or this other guy? I hate to say it, but most of us pick me. But God saw the trouble, saw the problem, loved us so much that He could not leave us that way. 
He could not just walk away. He could not just let us face our, our junk on our own, our sin on our own. He said, I've got to do something because my affection is so strong. I can't stand to watch this happen. Could you imagine the God of the universe looking at you with that kind of an affection? Now, some of us have a hard time believing that, but that is the truth when God looks at us. He is motivated into action because His love and the rest of what follows comes from that place. So I want to take a look into what does God's love look like? Because here's one of the things that we learn later on is that Christ asks the church and those who follow Him to love others the way that He loved us. All through the New Testament are all kinds of commands that say we're supposed to be loving towards other people because Christ first loved us, we give that to other people. This is a common theme throughout the Scripture. But if we're to love like Christ, and we're to understand that love is a crucial part of what Christ came to bring and to offer, then we need to recognize, well, what does Christ's love really look like? What does that feel like? How does the Bible describe it? So that we might capture what that is. That we might receive it, experience, and then give it away. This is the first thing that the Bible talks about. It says that God's love is sacrificial. Ephesians 5.2 says this, And walk in love. Listen. As Christ also has loved us, and given Himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We're to walk in love, but not a love that we define. A love that is defined by the actions of Christ who loved us and gave Himself for us. The key is, is that the Lord's Love is a sacrificial love. It is giving without expecting anything in return. When we talk about giving and loving sacrificial, it means that we offer something up. Something that is precious. Something that is big. And again, we expect nothing in return other than we're pouring this thing out. And when we look at what the Lord has done, it says very specifically that Christ gave Himself as a sacrifice. He did everything. He offered every part of who He was as an expression of His love towards us. Love gives everything. Come on, y'all. You've been in love before. Hopefully with the person you're sitting next to. But honestly, when you think about that uh, real feeling of love, parents to your kids, we understand love, don't we? Even some of the hardest of us, we understand love because when we look at our kids, we would give everything for them. There's nothing that we would withhold. And our love is so sacrificial even to our kids, to our spouse, to some of those people, maybe if you're not in that phase of life, that are a part of uh, of your inner circle, so to speak. But we would give everything to make sure that they were okay because we love them so much. And this is what Christ's love is like. It's sacrificial. It says, I love you so much, I'm willing to give everything that I have to make sure that you are okay. And if it costs me everything, that's okay. And guess what? It did cost Him everything. Because we understand, we know the rest of the story, and we know that all of this ended at a crucifixion and then a resurrection. Where Christ gave His very being to assure that we would be connected to the Lord and to His love. Correct? This is what Jesus actually taught. He said in John 15, 13, He said, Greater love 
has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And he goes on to teach even further than that. He says, look, he says, someone may give their life for someone who is great or someone that they, they really care about. But for the most part, people are not willing to give up their life so that someone else might live. There has to be something deeper than respect and other things involved. And that is love. And there is no greater expression in love than to lay down your life, and that is what Christ did for us. And so Christ's love is, first of all, sacrificial. It gives everything. Church, when we talk about loving like Christ, when we talk about love, because how many of you know it's one of the big topics everybody loves to talk about, and they love to define what love should look like. For us in the church, love is just like Christ's love. It's sacrificial. It gives up whatever is needed so that that expression can happen. The second thing is this, is God's love is blind. Romans 5, 8, it says this, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, what? I want to focus in not on the Christ died for us part, but that while we were what? Still sinners. You see, the inevitability of this story and the conclusion of this story is that Christ died for us. But the amazing part of this is not that Christ was willing to die for us. It's that while we were still sinners, that He did this. So in other words, Christ did not hold an account of who we were. He did not say, because of this you are disqualified. He did not say, look, you have sinned so greatly against me that I don't care about you anymore. He didn't say any of those things. What he said instead was, look, you're still a sinner, but I love you so much, I'm going to do this anyway because my love for you is blind. Now, how many of you have ever been in love with somebody that everybody that you knew was like, that is the wrong person, they are a screwed up individual? We've all had those relationships, right? But you don't see it. All you see is the good stuff, right? All, until something really goes wrong in the end, right? And then it's like, oh, I see what y'all were talking about. But in the midst of that, your love is blind. Your love causes you to only see what is good. Your love looks past the imperfections. Your love looks past the stupid things that that person does. And how many of you understand that that's a beautiful part of being in a marriage, right? I'm glad that my wife looks past my stupidity all the time and that her love is blind. Amen? Come on, ladies. No, it ain't. I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. But love is blind. It can blind us. And this is the kind of love that Christ has for us. When He looks at us, even though the world may look at us and say, oh, here is all of the things that you do wrong, and here's how you are a screw-up, and here's how you are unqualified. You know how many times I'm in conversations with people who know somebody in my church, and they like to tell me how that person's a sinner, as if like I'm going to be shocked? I think they really believe that I walk around with my eyes just like I'm like an idiot or something, you know? But the truth of the matter is, is that's all of us. And while the world looks at those things and disqualifies us from being a follower of Christ because all of the things that we have done that, we can, be held, that can be held against us, and they see maybe the bad side of the individual. Christ doesn't see that. When Christ looks at us, here's the beautiful part. When Christ looks at us, He sees the person you were meant to be. He sees who you were created by God to be. He looks past the sin. He doesn't see the sin. 
And he doesn't say you're a screw up and you're, you don't deserve it and, and here's all the things you've done wrong. Because let me tell you something, there's not one thing that any one of us has ever done that the Lord himself has not been aware of. So if there's anybody who can come up with a list, it's him. But he looks deeper. He looks beyond the actions. He looks beyond the disappointments. He looks beyond the failures. Because he is blind to those things because of his love for us. And it is what causes him to want to reach in and pull those things out. Do you guys understand that that's one of the beautiful parts of the gospel? And one of the beautiful parts about experiencing God's love is that eventually what he wants to do is he wants to pull that good stuff up to the surface and he wants to put to death the junk. And the result of that is what most of us call a testimony, isn't it? I once was this and now I'm that. Well, guess what? It's because of the blindness of God's love who chooses willingly to look past your junk. In the same way, again, the church, if we're to express the love of God that we've been so freely given, then we need to be a people who can look past other people's messes and not identify them according to their messes, but call out what is good and what is God in them. And to be an agent of forgiveness. Next thing is this, is that God's love is freeing. Read a passage of Scripture, 1 John 4, 16-20. It says this, So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in Him. So I want you to just stop there for a moment because I want you to understand that if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, a part of that is that you should be experiencing and engaging the love of Jesus on a daily basis. God is love, so you can't be around Him without experiencing it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that because of that love that God has for us, that we should be abiding in it. We should be swimming in it. We should be experiencing that and feeling that. And then, of course, pouring that out. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as He is also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love does what? It casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Listen, we love because of what? That's right. But there's two things in this passage of Scripture that I want to just uh, really extract for a few moments. The first thing is this. Is that we have confidence for the day of judgment because of God's love. And I want to break that down for you just really briefly, but do you understand that all of us, no matter who we are, big or small, super faithful, you know, perfect Christian, or the worst of us. It doesn't matter. Every single one of us at some point will be standing before the Lord and God will look at us and will judge us according to who we were. And the judgment comes down to this according to Christ. We either loved Him or we didn't. We either chose Him or we didn't. But each one of us will stand judgment. And how many of you understand that many people, if they're honest with themselves and they think about their death and they think about what might come after that, that there is a fear maybe that is in there because they don't know. 
They don't know what will happen to them when they die. And they don't know if God would be approving of them or not. And many of them, if you ask people a question, you know what they're going to tell you? Well, I've, I've lived a pretty good life. I've done good things. I've done all this stuff. So surely God would maybe be okay with me, right? And so there's a question. And as long as there's a question, there's fear. But the love of God supersedes all of that. Because in Christ, we know that we're loved by God. And we're no, we know that we're not uh, objects of wrath. Like maybe we once were. As we lived in open rebellion to the Lord. And so we can walk into that judgment with confidence. Have you ever gotten in trouble... And the person you were held accountable to was somebody that you were friends with. Has that ever happened to anybody? And this could be like, I got in trouble in college a few times with the administration. One of the things I used to do was prank call the administration and act like I was an upset parent. And one time I got called in to deal with this because there was an upset parent and they thought I was, it was me pranking them. And it didn't go well. But I also was really good friends with the president of the college, with some of the staff that was there. I was, so when I went in and I got called in on the carpet, I wasn't afraid. And I got a slap on the wrist and they sent me my merry way. But when you know the person and you know that the outcome will be good, do you really, are you really afraid to go and face the punishment? You're not. The same thing with the Lord. When you know that God loves you, are you afraid of, of judgment? No, you can walk into that knowing that God's like, oh, you're here. And instead of hearing judgment and condemnation, His love expressed towards you is uh, in these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. And so we have confidence because God loves us. Because we've experienced that love, it builds the confidence that we know that we're not going to face judgment. And so then it says the other thing about this, the other part of this passage, it says that love casts out what? Fear. Fear. You no longer have to be afraid if you know God loves you, right? You can walk with a level of confidence, understanding that God loves you instead. And because of that love, I don't have to walk around in fear anymore. Because my outcome is in the hands of God, the God of the universe who loves me. And the last thing is this. God's love is welcoming. 1 John 3 1, it says this. And there's actually a song, if you all know it. You don't have to sing it, but there is a song. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. And here's something that I think that we need to understand is that God loves us so much that He not only saves us, He not only cares about us, He not only restores us, but He calls us in to be a part of His family. We become His children, and we become joint heirs with Him, and all of this happens because God loves us. We are no longer cast out. We are no longer, in that term, outcasts. We are no longer running around like a chicken with our head cut off. God says, come. And He welcomes us because He loves us so much. He's like, good, you've gotten your act together. Come in now. And be a part of my family. And be a part of this thing that I'm doing on the earth. And be accepted. You know, that's one of the the biggest areas of concern for most people is whether or not that they're accepted or not. 
Many of the decisions we make in life, we make because we want to fit in and we want to be accepted. And oftentimes those things lead us down uh, bad roads. Because it's those paths where we get accepted. Well, when Christ comes, He says, you're accepted, not because of the things you're doing, but because I love you and I'm pulling you in to be mine. Doesn't it feel good to be wanted? Don't you know that you're loved when people bring you in? And don't you understand that as they bring you in, and they lose, like, if you've got a good friend, they're a good friend no matter what, right? There's nothing you can do. I've had some really good friends, and I've done some stupid things. But as those things pass, I'm still a friend. And this is how God is with us. He pulls us in. He says, I love you so much. You're a part of who I am, and that's never going to go anywhere. And we're welcomed. All of us, no matter where we come from, when we come to the Lord, we are welcomed in as sons and daughters. Isn't that beautiful? And so here's the thing as we bring this to a close. And I want you to understand this. One of the things, one of the greatest things that Christ did for us is He loved us. We need to recognize what that love is. We need to lean into that. Because as we do, it changes who we are. How we perceive the world around us. How we perceive people. And what it is that we're living our lives for. And it brings a level of security into who we are. that we can cry out. If you have given your life to Jesus, you are loved no matter what. Some of you need to hear that this morning. God's love is not conditional. It is given freely. That looks past the flaw. So as we celebrate Jesus in this season, as we begin to think about the birth of Christ, and as we get into this season of celebration, let us really think about how God loved us. So today we're just going to close with a simple prayer. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Would you guys just stand up? I'm going to pray this morning that God would give you an experience with His love. And that in this season, that God would remind you of what that love has done in your life. Let's go to the Lord. God, we come to You this morning. We come before You and we recognize that love truly is a key in our relationship with You. We recognize, Lord, that You have loved us first. And that we have received love from You. And Lord, we're grateful and thankful. Lord, in this season as we celebrate the birth of Your Son, Lord, would You give us a fresh reminder of what that love means to each one of us. Lord, help us to experience just a a, a simple moment, a simple action of love, Lord, from You. And help us, Lord, to just be uh, just mindful of the change that has come in our lives. Because You simply love us. So Lord, we thank You for sending Your Son, Jesus. And we thank You.